Right, so here we are just about to start playing with um, Cisco, do some basic IP stuff. I've got three Cisco routers here, they're all Cisco 3725s with appropriate IOSes loaded, we'll see that a little bit later. We can see I've got a laptop PC up the top right that's being used to interrogate. Currently it's connected to the same subnet as router A on its fast Ethernet port, fast Ethernet 00, as indicated by the port up here at the top with this little bubble on the side which has got dot one inside which is part of its IP address. That IP address is part of the subnet. We can see the subnet to which router A is connected to through this interface. That subnet is 192.168.250.0 slash 24. So slash 24 of course means 255.255.255.0. And we can see that because the host, so another device connected to the same network, all of those devices must have the same mask, and this indeed does. It has a different IP address of course, but on the same subnet. So 192.168.250.0 will be the subnet, but dot two is the IP address, like dot one over here. So this dot one actually means 192.168.250.1. Just showing the bit of the address that's changed. We can see that router A also has serial interfaces as well, which connects it through to router C and router B. In fact, as you look around the picture, you can see there are three Ethernet networks and three uh, blue ones, the blue ones being serial ports. Those serial ports are in fact um, supported by WICs, those, those are WAN interface cards, WIC 2Ts and WIC 1Ts as required. So that's two ports and single port devices. So there's a number of serial ports we'll see and we'll see these other fast Ethernet ports. The Cisco 3725 actually has two fast Ethernet ports. I'm using the first of those in each case. I'm using fast Ethernet port 0 slash 0. Could have used 0 slash 1 as well. Notice down here we've got a different subnet. This is connected to router B, 192.168.151.0 slash 24. We've used the first usable IP address down here. Whereas on router C, similar arrangement, fast ethernet 00, but this subnet now is 192.168.201.0 slash 24. So a different subnet, and we've used the highest usable address over here, so that's the dot two five four. Onto the serial interfaces, so from router A we use serial 00 down to router C. Yes, I've used serial 00 here, but didn't have to be. Any of the available ports, uh, you know, subject to configuring them correctly and having the correct cable will be fine. 172.29.1.160 is the subnet. With a slash 28, that tells us that up to and including the 160 is indeed the subnet. So 169 is a host on that subnet, as is 170. Looking over on router A again, on serial 03 this time, that goes between A and B. And we can see that we've got 172.28.1.160 slash 28. Similar looking subnets, 255.255.255.240. But, uh, look at the address here, that's subtly changed to 172.28 as opposed to 172.29. The slash 28 takes us all the way down to and including the 160 though, remember. So, 161, good example of the first usable address on that subnet anyway, and 162, as we can see down here. So I've tended to use the bottom end of the rates down here on that particular subnet, and the top ends of this subnet. Just as an example, of course, two different subnets, remember, two different IP addresses. B to C uses 10.14.1.16 on serial 02. Remember, it doesn't have to be 02 at both ends. The IP address of the subnet is the same as reinforced by the mask. The mask length is different. It's now slash 30. This is a point to point connection. This is the old sort of traditional way of doing point to points called slash 31 became more of the norm. In fact, you can actually use unnumbered interfaces as well because it's point to point. There's only two devices here. I've got to go from B to C via this interface. It doesn't need an IP address. However, we've got one. Slash 30 then would reveal against 16 as the subnet, dot 17 the first usable address, and 18 the last usable address, because 19 is in fact his broadcast. So there we go, those are the interfaces between routers A, routers B, and routers C, and the subnets that are hanging off them as well. Well, let's bring up the uh, PC and see what we can see. 
So the PC itself, let's uh, ping itself. So 192.168.250.2. To put a 2 in there, Mick, that will help. And we can see it can ping itself. Always useful. And then ping the other end of the cable, or whatever cable you've got. You might have a switch in the way. Indeed, I have. So I've actually got a Cisco 3750 switch in between those two. So that's proving the cables and the switch. Yeah. Uh, making sure that we've got connectivity to and from router A. Good. Well, can we go any further? Could we ping all the way down here? Can we ping through router A and down through into router B? Well, let's ping that IP address. It's 172.28.1.162. So that goes away. Yep, the pings are working. The pings are firing. OK, so good. That's coming through. Is it going through router A to router B? I think so. Let's trace route it and find out. So use trace route as opposed to ping. Same address. Oops, put the right address in there, Mick. Does help. Oh, da, da. There we go. Oh, must put a space in there. Always remember the space. There we go. So where's it going? It's going through, tracing through. It's gone via router A. We can see that. Remember, that's the 192.168.250.1. And then it's gone straight down to 172.28.1.162. Well, that's at least the way we think it's gone. Yeah, we think it's gone directly through these two and then back up again. OK? That's what it suggests. To understand it further, we need to interrogate the nodes themselves. So to interrogate them further, what we really need to do is engage with some suitable uh, connection to these devices. Now, you could remotely connect to them if, one, you were allowed to. Um, if there was password set, if the firewalls allowed you in, well there's no firewall set on here at the moment, so that's fine, but there's no password set either. So you won't be able to remote log in using things like Telnet or Secure Show, it's just not set up. So I need a local connection. To do that I use the console port and I connect using the Cisco Blue Cable directly into the router. Now the console port itself is actually a serial interface. Uh, and I could use things like hyperthermal, that's sort of old days people would use hyperthermal. Well, nowadays, of course, we all tend to use putty. So let's bring putty into the equation. Now, in fact, if I go back to the sessions tab, which is the normal tab that you open up in, what I've done here is I've loaded in, so I've found in my list, I've loaded in number 20, so load that in. I was loading number 12 just to prove the point. So it's loaded in 12 and we've got the configuration for 12. So let's go and find number 20. And it has to be 20 in this case because the way my machine is set up. And that's a reflection of what's actually set up in the device manager. So uh, if you go into your start, if you're Windows 7 and above, just type, hit the, the start button in Windows, then type device manager and then up pops device manager if you then go down and look at the actual ports, then you'll see that I've got port 20. Uh, simply removing the port, you'll see that it disappears, put the port back in, you'll see it reappears. So you'll find out which port that you need to use. Um, so it's port 20, or COM 20, load that in, so that's COM 20, 9600 board, serial type connection. So look at the serial, look down here in the categories, look at serial. It has to be 9600, 8 bits, 1 stop bit, no parity, and let's, let's turn flow control off. OK, let's open that. So that will prompt us now for privilege access, because I'm running that as administrator. Uh, and then we will see our COM20. It's uh, connected to the console. It's in fact connected to the console on host name of router A, so that's part of the configuration. And it's telling me to press return to get started. So press return I do. Notice I get the host name again, but I get this sign after that, which is this greater than sign, which really means I'm at a particular level of access, which is known as the user exec. So I can do a certain level of commands, and I'll just show the privilege. So show privilege is the command. And you can see the privilege level I have is a privilege level 1, which means I can only do a baseline set of commands. So I'll use the question mark here to see what I can do. And you can see I've got a, a, a set of commands that are available to me, including things like ping. Yeah, so as, uh, there's also the ability to do things uh, like telnet or secure shell or trace route. That's a limited set of commands that you can actually do here. 
Uh, but I could elevate those commands out of this by changing them uh, command by command to a higher level of privilege. It would actually take them out of this altogether. So I'm just going to go back out. So I'm going to log out. See, by pressing return, what I did is logged in. But normally that would be protected by a console login and a, co and a password associated with that. So I wouldn't simply press return and gain access. That gets me to that first level. If I type enable, then that will take me up to, and then you can see the prompt changes from a greater than sign to a hash. So that means I've actually gone up to now what's called the privilege exec. It's otherwise known as the enable mode, but I use the enable command to get there. But to get from the user level, so that's the greater than sign, to the privileged exec level, which is the hash, there should be another password there called the enable password or the enable secret two different variants um, but essentially you should be prompted at this point and be expected to know a password in order to get to this higher level because if I just use the command history oh, indeed no it can't because I logged out so if I do show privilege again you'll see that I've got a value of 15 that's the highest level so I can do everything so here at this prompt there's lots of commands that I can engage in lots more than there were before by some measure. Many of those commands I still don't know what they do. But there we go, you use them as you need them. So at this level I've got my um, effectively my privilege level access and I tend to do things like show, I might turn some of my debugging operations on, if I'm not sure what I can do then put a question mark after it. You can build the commands up by that method. In fact if I wasn't sure how to spell debug, maybe I should know how to do that. I could do a question mark, see if there's anything else that starts D E B. Yeah, or perhaps D E. Oh, it's delete. So if I was typing these in, debug would be all that I would need in order to know I'm in the debugging command. And then I'd see the question mark after that, I could see that I can do the same sort of things as before. I'll talk about that later. So or at a later time, I should say. So there's a whole range of things, memory management stuff, so backups and restores, that type of activity can also be conducted from here as well. So copies, copy uh, information from your running configuration to your startup configuration, which is from your uh, current running RAM associated with the actual running of that machine, so your runtime, uh, and then saving that, backing it up to your startup config. That's the one that it uses when it boots up or starts up. So there's a couple of config files that uh, we need to have a look at and you can see those if you do a DIR I'm gonna hit the tab key yep it was unique enough so we see the DIR all file systems press return on that and what we can see here is we've got system which is RAM and we can see finally in there the primary one we'd be interested in this moment is the running config check the size of that that running config Got temporary system folder here. Let's have a look see what else we've got. So we build that up. System was at the top, remember. You've got your NVRAM, so this is flash. So this this will survive being restarted. And it's that startup config in particular. There are other files that are needed by the machine when it would boot up. Uh, and there is another one down here which I actually set. This is actually a, a, a multicast router A config file that I've saved. I've I've saved a backup copy of that. That's not the one that will be used at boot up because it will use that at boot up. It will copy that across into the running config. So those two, if I haven't changed anything, would be the same. Right? So the startup config here and the running config should be of the same order. So something's changed there, Houston. So if that's the case, then I would consider making a, uh, saving that by using the copy run start. So let's have a look and see what else is here. So so I'm using the return key to go line by line as you do with sort of more. But what you can see here is I've got directory of flash. Now flash is NVRAM again but it's a particular piece of NVRAM because this is where your IOS is sits. Now I've actually got two files here, two bi bin files or binary files here, two different versions of the Cisco 3725 software. So I've got an advanced IP services and I've got an advanced enterprise. 
So there's different feature sets that are loaded into Cisco IOS of old, uh, and uh, you'd have to pick your feature set to, to match the requirements. So I tend to use my advanced IPv services as sort of a baseline stuff. Then when I want to go into sort of uh, MPLS and BGP, then I have to raise the game a bit. So that's why I tend to use my uh, advanced enterprise one as well. So that's the sort of stuff we can have a little play with uh, a little bit later on. And as to which one of those is actually executed to, to start off with, well that will be in the boot profiles, the boot uh, uh, instance will identify that. There's another copy, look, there's one in here called slot zero. This is a, this is a, a card that you can slot into the front of these units. So um, it's actually not labelled up as slot zero on the outside of the unit, it's actually labelled up as CF1. To the old compact disc format, so, so CF1 was actually slot zero, and it's slot zero because you can see it in software as slot zero. So, in fact, I put that in there and I did a copy from slot zero into Flash in order to make uh, that, that copy available internally as well. Oh, in fact, actually, that copy there internally available as well. So, that's the sort of thing that you can actually do. In fact, I can take that card away and then can go and store that in a cupboard somewhere uh, and use that at a, a later point in time if things go horribly wrong. So, one of the things I could do at this moment in time is do a copy running config to startup config. Use the tab there to uh, cheat. It will say, is the destination the... is that correct? Now, you don't answer yes to this. You press return. There's a few files called Y uh, knocking around and they are simply because people have done it wrong. So press return and what it does it's now taking the running config and copying that to the startup config. In other words it's backing up your copy locally. So if we do a DIR all file systems again we'll see those two files listed and this time they are of equal length. 1251 and 1251. Good job. The job is done. You can actually go in and delete things and money, but that's again is for something we're going to do another day. Right, so we're in. We can see a little bit of the file information. That tells you some of the things that you can do at this level. Now to to this is that that elevated level, that privilege exact, but there's a level above this really. And that's the global configuration level, which you get to using configure terminal. OK, and you can see the prompt has changed now to config. And this is where you do all your router config. So you set up your OSPFs or ISIS or your BGP. You would set up your static routes. Um, you'd set up um, a, a whole range of things. Well, hosting, for instance, would be set up in here. Yep. A lot of the configuration takes place here. You get into setting up your use, your usernames and passwords, your enable passwords, your logging passwords, um, your telnet passwords, or support for telnet or not, support for SSH or not, secure shell of course. So this is the level that you would actually go to in order to do that. Now we need to get into those different things such as I need to get into a particular interface. So I type in interface, say fast ethernet, I'm going to cheat again using the tab key and zero zero so I'm into that and I can start to configure in here. Now once I've done my configuration I'd probably want to drop out of that and actually look to see if that's actually taken hold so I'd want to do some show commands and they're not available here. So to get to those I need to exit out of here and exit out of global configuration and then I could start to do my show commands. Now as I exited you notice I get a line out to console so what I could do is I can do control R there's a command I could put in called logging synchronous, but we'll do that later. Control R, and what you can see here is the show command has now been repeated as far as uh, up to the point I'd finished typing before this line came in. So, in terms of what that interface looks like, well, it's actually part of the running config because I make changes to the running config, and then remember I have to back them up using copy running config to startup config. Remember the hyphen in the middle, or simply do copy run start. There are some older commands that people may be aware of, such as write mem, but we won't go into that. So show a running config. Now, as a result of that, what I will actually see is the full configuration. So we'll start off with uh, right at the start here. We can see some version information. 
we can see the host name uh, you might want to modify the boat process so you've got these tags beginning and end of boot so everything in between would be what it needs to do at boot some other bits and pieces we'll see here this is in fact um, effectively the same as a slash except for slash hosts so I've got this IP host thing going on here and that what that means is that router A will be translated into that IP address so if you ping the router A suitably typed then it will ping 172.19.1.10 which 1.10 which happens to be its uh, loop back address uh as we'll see um so as we go down through I've, I've I've put the same information into all three routers you see just a bit of a copy and paste went on there ba -ba 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 -ba. you might want to you might want to ping yourself so I'm just using the return key just to bring it in. You could use a spacebar of course to go a page at a time. First of the interfaces we can see that's in the configuration is a loop back, loop back zero, and you'll notice the mask is all ones, so it's essentially slash thirty two. Whereas this is slash twenty four and that one there oh hang on a minute, Houston. What should that be? So when we look at this one here, this is telling me at the top here that those bits correspond to the actual subnet and that's the first address on that subnet. Mm. This here, 169, should have had a slash 28, so what's that doing? At sla that's a slash 24, so we need to modify that, so let's do that. So serial zero zeros in and this is on router A. So if we have a look through, just what I did there is just complete the the rest of it just by using the space bar and then I can actually just scroll back through anyway. So we can actually have a look see what other configuration we've got in here. Oh look at that. So we need to go and modify those. So we could do that. Now we did the show run but and I can do a show run, which would be the abbreviated form of that, or I can do a sh run. That will do. To, to, to get to know one, if you do sh and then tab, it'll fill it in. So we know that was what it was, and R R U N and tab that, and that's what that is. So it, it's unambiguous once you've got to that level, so show run is fine. What I can do is I can look for particular parts of the configuration. In fact, I could do a, sh a show run interface and then look at the serial interface and in fact I can abbreviate that simply as S serial 0 3 and you'll see that configuration then for serial 0 3 I could also do it a slightly different way which is to use a pipe command let's see what I've got available to me by using the question mark again and you can see I've got options here including section so let's use that section <laughs> see what happens here serial 0 3 nothing put the space in there nothing but if I did that for OSPF bomb so if I want to see the interface then I use that form and that does give me the interface so a quicker way to get to different bits of I could use show run and include as a keyword and you can abbreviate that probably there actually um, but that would be things that's, that's for things that occur on the same line so for instance you remember those host statements let's do those there you go so all the lines that had host in them popped up so that would be a quick way of finding those uh, another classic word to use would be to use the word root because okay router OSPF showed up but if there was any static routes which there aren't but if there was any static routes they would show up here because they statements are IP root and something so a good little way of, of using that so use the show run and the pipe command use the question mark and there's a few things you can do so not you don't have to see the whole of the routing table you can actually see parts of the routing table right we've got some stuff to change so we can use this to our advantage so we can do the show run interface and then what we can do is we can actually go in and make modification to that so conf t is the abbreviation for configure terminal we need to go into the interface itself so int is suitable for interface and s is suitable for serial and it's 03 now we don't have to and in fact 
because we're in putty what we can do is we can actually make use of the bits that are right by highlighting those and then right clicking so we get up to that point and then put the 240 in at the end I don't have to take the old entry out to put the new entry in I can simply write over the top you can do secondary addresses you can do secondary addresses but that's that's uh, something you could add to this. We're, we're looking at the primary address and we're modifying that primary address by just changing that field setting. So that's being done, okay, or has it, I hear you say. Now at this level I can't do the show run because it will error. But if I put, if I did show run, so that's using the up arrow, control A to take you back to the start of line, put a do in front and then a space, then it would work, but I don't want the whole of that. I don't want to do that, so control C that, repeat that. What I want to do is I want to just do it so that it is from that serial list, but I have to remember how to type that. I can't use the tab keys here at all because I'm running at a different level to where it should be run. So here you can see that my change has taken place. Good. Okay. Right. To, to, to reinforce that, if I do control, if I do control Z, that takes me all the way out. That's control Z. That takes me all the way back to the hash prompt. And if I do a show run from here, I can use the tab key, uh, and and that will do the infill for me. I'm sorry, in, we're doing interface here, aren't we? So serial zero three. The other interface, of course, was serial zero zero. Let's check the config of that. Oh, so in config T into the interface serial zero uh, zero this time again we can cheat by using putty that's why we like putty so highlight it then right click then make your change hit return that's job done boom that into the, that's just because OSPF running in the background control Z that now the most important thing you should do now so remember that line comes in just because we've dropped back is do a copy, run, start. That's the shortest ver form of running hyphen config, startup hyphen config. So it does say startup config, so we're happy it is the right place, but remember just press return here, not yes. Job's good. So it should be uh, it should be happy, we hope. Show IP interface brief, that's the possibly the shortest version. Let's drop those letters off there as well. And yes, that is correct. So we can see the IP addresses were as before. It was the masks that were different. And what we need to make sure, of course, is that the interfaces are unabated and they are still up and up. Okay. That tells me that this, at the serial level, they're up and up. So that's the protocol execution level, right? So whichever level the protocol runs at, that's what we'll see. Now, another interesting command, actually, that uh, would be useful looking at this moment in time is show IP protocols. Um, so like show IP interface brief, show IP protocols is probably one of the first commands that you use just to see what's there. So if there's no dynamic routing protocols, it'll just be empty. Yep. There'll be nothing returned. But here you can see I'm running OSPF. So there's a routing protocol running. You can see that uh, the router ID here is actually taking the loopback address. 172.19.110 is the loopback address that we see above. Um, ignore this statement here because at this moment in time I've, I've got this running in a single flat area. Um, so what we can see coming down through the number of areas for this this in this router is one. Yeah, and it's it's a it's effectively it's a normal area. I haven't done anything special to the config, so I haven't I haven't I haven't constrained it down to being a stub or a stubby network or a not so stubby area. So I haven't changed the config, so it takes it on in life as a normal single flat OSPF area at this moment in time. Maximum number of paths, that's for equal cost path, multipath. Maximum paths is four for OSPF. Could be up to six. And then we've got the routing for networks. So I've got it exchanging information about that network. Exchanging information about that network. So it's exchanging information about 172.28.1160. 
and 172.29.116. So that's the two serial interfaces, right? And then we see here the reference bandwidth, of course, being fast Ethernet. Uh, and then we can see again we've got those two. So that's that's the loopback address for B because I use 10 for A, 20 for B, 30 for C. Oh, and, and the distance here it's talking about is something called the administrative distance. Cisco calls that the well, we, we call that the trustworthiness. So the higher the number, the less trustworthy it is. But uh, 110 beats ISIS because ISIS has a value of 115, and it beats RIP because RIP has a value of 120. It doesn't beat static routes, uh, and it doesn't beat locally connected because locally connected sort of has a silent value of zero because it's locally connected. Of course, it's here, and static routes are built by humans and machines. Funnily enough, trust humans, and therefore those static routes are preferred over and above any dynamic routing protocols. So here we've got the administrative distance of 110. Static routes have an administrative distance of 1. So lower the value, the, 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 the more trustworthy they are. So that's a pecking order really for those. So this is running here. Now interestingly we've only got two networks. So here's another use of that show run. We'll use the pipe command this time. We'll use section and we'll use OSPF. So let's see. What is OSPF talking about? Indeed, look, it's talking about those two networks. But then I, what about the third network? What about the, the, the fast ether? How do I know about that? Well, that actually is one of the connected networks and that's being redistributed. And that's being redistributed, and we're using the, the, the keyword here, subnets, so that I can actually redistribute it in a classless way. So it's not a class A, class B, class C, it's classless. So use these variable length subnet masks, not fixed to the 8-bit boundaries. So if I look in the routing table, show IP root, this is locally, I can see that I've got information in here which is connected and there's three entries connected because there are three locally connected interfaces. There's the fast Ethernet, there's the serial zero, there's the other serial zero, but hang on, there's another entry of course because there's also the loopback. That's counted as a locally connected because it's here, it's local. So we can also see I've got some mention here of O's to find out which one. Look up here in the key so after the IP route you get the, the codes or key uh, and you can see C for connected, S for static route and so on but if you look O is for OSPF, uh, so is IA so if you had different areas, we only have one area here you could have inter area stuff if you built them up as not so stubby then you get NSA, uh, NSSA which is N1 and N2 in type um, when you do redistribution locally, uh, you get E1s and E2s. Okay, E2 by default, as you can see, E2 by default. So that's from somebody else. Somebody else has told me something. Yeah, who's told me something? Well, I've got that information from. Uh, well, it's about B, in fact. Look, because it's the loopback address for B. Okay, and I learnt that through a, an, an OSPF. Well, a redistribution into OSPF. Um, router C was learnt slightly differently. Router C was actually learnt as as an OSPF entry. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So let's go and have a look at router C and see how router C did that. So we just bring up the uh, the putty session and just press return a couple of times. There we are. We're in enable in the short form. We're into to where we are. So. If we were to have a look and see how this has behaved, and, and again, we're going to have a look at the running configuration, but this is on router C this time, uh, and we're going to have a look at the section, which is OSPF. We can see here, what's actually happened is there's four statements here. I ignore the log adjacent changes, that will come automatically. But there's four statements here. They're all in area one, so all three routers are actually in area one. And what you can see here is it's got all of the statements. So this is the 10, 14, 1, 16. So that's the network between router B and router C. So we can see that that's, that's this one here, look, 10, 14, 1, 16. Then we've got the 172, 
uh, 19. Now 00, zero here, I've, I, what I've done is I've just done anything that starts 17219. Now that's reinforced by this value here which is called a wildcard mask. Look, it's not a mask written backwards, it's actually a wildcard mask. So where you had a 255 before, we get a 0. It's the inverse. So 255, that's the equivalent of 255.255.0.0. .255 the inverse of 255 is 0. So here, look at this one here. That's the same as a subnet mask of 255.255.255.252. Yep, the inverse of 255 is 0. The inverse of 252 is 3. How do I know that? Well, the inverse is simply to start with 255 and take the value away. So 255 minus 3 is 252. 255 minus 0 is 255. So that's how we get from wildcard masks back to subnet masks. So I tend to read those as subnet masks, flip them around. And then we have the area statements. So here is the 17229. That's the interface, of course, this one, going between A and C. And then finally, at the bottom there, we've got the subnet at the bottom the 192.168.201 so that's what we've got down here so that's why when we see the information on A which was advertised let's just track our little ways back up here see if he's still on screen I bet you he's not it'll be just off it always is right okay let's go back to A So we'll do a, a quick, in fact it's probably just there in memory, there it is. I think I went past it to be perfectly honest. That's the A variety compared to the C variety above. So C has four statements in it, whereas whereas you can see in, in the case of A it only has three. So those those are just as really as as C has done. You know, very prescriptive that they are identifying the networks uh, quite closely there. Look, look at the look at those wildcard masks but it's then it's got this statement here which is saying right anything else that's connected including loopbacks redistribute that but these get redistributed as external to OSPF these actually get redistributed internal to OSPF so when you use a redistribute command that's why it becomes an E type so again if you do show IP root the key the E refers to external, external. They're external to OSPF. They've been redistributed in. Right, um, and another thing we could do, of course, we could do show run, uh, and instead of doing everything, what we could do is we could pin that down. Yeah, so uh, what I could do is I could look at something particular. So I might want to have a look at one of the routing protocols that, that's actually in, in, in there instead, okay? So let's just do the OSP. Oh, let's just do the OSPF stuff instead. Show run. No, not show run. Show IP OSP. Uh, show IP root with OSPF. Get it right in a minute. That's the beastie. Okay. So when we're looking at this, we're, what we're, we're pinning this down now into just the OSPF info, which of course includes the E2s. So you can see here the administrative distance for each of these is 110. That's what this first value means, administrative distance. And then the second value is the cost. The cost. So that's the total cost to get to that destination. So the total cost to get to this destination, bear in mind we're talking about route array, the total cost to get to this particular network here 10, 14, 1, 16, by OSPF is 128. But it's 128 twice. That's because A can see this network via C and via B. So what we got here is two possible paths of equal cost. And we can see that again reflected in here in the routing table. So the routing table shows us that information. We could see, look, the IP address here. That 170 is on C. That 162 is on B. 
It also tells you it's from router A, it's using serial 00. Well, we know that goes to router C. And serial 03, we know that goes to router A. Here we go, look, serial 00 goes through to router C, and serial 03 goes through to router B. So that's the that's the way round you should read that. Okay. So what else have we got? Um, yeah, the metric costs do vary. Yeah, the metric costs do vary, uh, and we can find out a lot more about that. We'll investigate that on another video when we look at OSPF. But OSPF has a database, so show IP OSPF database, and it's from that information. That doesn't look too detailed, but in fact, there's more information hiding behind these things. Yeah, there's far more information hiding behind these things. So if I do show IP OSPF database, and I, if I look at the router entries, what you'll see is that these expand out quite considerably. Yeah, and again, we'll do that uh, at another time. But that's the show IP OSPF database and subsequent commands. And that's one thing you should bear in mind. OSPF exchanges information a lot fuller, a lot richer information, more information. So we get, you know, to get a view of the whole topology. And then we sort of offer up to the routing table only the best paths from OSPF. OK, and then, and then the routing table doesn't just take OSPF, remember. Yeah, when we look at the routing table, the routing table is in fact made up of the best entries. So it'll have some from OSPF. But of course, you can't beat locally connected, and you wouldn't be able to beat static routes for that matter either if they were there. So they would actually beat uh, essentially OSPF. Right. So we've got a, a, a sort of a, a baseline entry into uh, our routers uh, and the and the way that they behave. I just wanted to just reinforce the sort of way in, way out sort of things a bit again, and again that's that's sort of based on passwords. Um, and also the, the correct use of the commands. Again, we're at that sort of privileged exec or enable mode, if you prefer to call it. Remember, we use enable to get to here. So disable should be the way the, the way out of this. And that gets you back to that ha that greater than sign. So out of hash, back to greater than. Uh, and then we should log out from there. So that takes you back sort of step by step. Pressing return logs you in, because there's no prompt for a password and enable or en takes you back up. Now at this level instead of using the sort of two step out I could have simply typed exit and I'm out. Okay. So going back in again and enable if you type exit that will take you straight the way back out again. Okay. Now remember if you're anywhere if you're glo global configuration if you're doing some configuration on a fast ethernet port control Z takes you right the way back to the hash prompt okay and then you can do all your show commands and the like from from this particular particular point okay so that's the sort of the sort of thing that uh, that you sort of can engage with in terms of that sort of moving around remember of course if you're up in global configuration and if you want to do a show command the show commands will not work but if you remember if you put a do in front of that then it will work Okay, so the do is the thing that you put in front. So, but the trouble the trouble with do is it says, well, I, I just want you to put a command in. Okay, well, I want to do a show. I show what? Well, question mark won't really reveal anything. It doesn't reveal the options. You can only do that. Well, Control Z will take you back. And if you did a show, and, and if you did a Control R, if you did a show and a question mark. Uh, that's where you would be at. Now, I'll, ju I'll just show you very quickly. So, global configuration. Um, and if I do a show run, oops, if I do a do show run, just immediately after I've just told you what to do, eh? Do a do show run. And what I'll do here is I'll do a begin um, at that console zero. So, what you can see here is that this is the different ways in. So, that's the line console. At the moment there's no there's no there's no prompt there, remember you go straight into the greater than sign. The running alongside that you could have an auxiliary port, routers yes, switches maybe not. But then you might also want to do remote access using things like Telnet. So Telnet would use uh, would be a virtual teletype connection using one of the five available sessions zero through to four. It's asking for login, but 
it won't let you in because no passwords have been set. Uh, th th there's no request for login here, and there's no request for login here. That's why you're not. That's why you're not prompted at those. Well, we've only looked at the console to be fair. Now, I'm at the global configuration level, so I can go and configure the line console, line console zero. Uh, and one of the commands that I would sort of recommend here is if you do this logging and it's synchronous, okay, logging synchronous, then you know when I come out, you remember that annoying line that gets in the way when I want to do a show run, right? You notice what immediately happened. I didn't do anything here this time. I did show run. It did the annoying line, but it then repeated the what I'd done so far, up to and including, automatically. And that's what logging synchronous does. Okay? So it stops that annoying thing of, of you. where am I? There's loads of stuff on the screen. Where am I? Okay. Oh, another thing that might be of interest to you is, if, certainly if you come and inherit something, is do a show debug. And at the moment there's nothing running and no debug all um, using the abbreviator that might get away with that yeah if you're not sure use the tab key yeah it would have been fine and all so I don't need to know what's there I could just stop it and that can stop all annoying output coming up to screen good so so it can, it can stop the process associated with it of course as well which is probably what you're trying to save so bear that in mind so those are some of the commands that we can use uh, in, in this basic configuration. So we'll have a look at that in the next part, uh, a little bit more detail. Um, but we'll leave that there for now. We'll continue on using this basic setup to interrogate that a little bit further.